Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me once again today. Welcome back to Dominions 5 for another Basic Nation Analysis. And this is Basic Nation Analysis Facia, Middle Age Facia. Now, I'm actually starting this early. This is only turn 7, not turn 12. And I'm doing this because I want to show off the one of the peculiar national traits of Facia before I get kind of started diving into the whole the whole thing. So you may notice I don't have all that many provinces. One, two, three, four, five, six. Despite having a pretty beefy awake expander. Um, that's because I've run into uh, some really bad luck here. My provinces surrounding me were uh, A, not very good. You can see income 26, resources 12. Um, high income, very high income over here. But all these provinces were very heavily defended as well. Like this right here, 50 units, mainly knights. Um, fairly typical, to be honest. And this isn't even all that good a province. 14 resources, 55 income. So these provinces down here were very, very tough. It was very good that I took this Awake Expander because the Awake Expander has actually been my only expansion. My National Starting Army kind of had to go with him in order to break these provinces one at a time. And then I got attacked by barbarians in my capital. It's been unlucky. But what I want to point out is Facia has a unique mechanic that has to be considered right at the beginning of the game. And that is the Dark Vessels. Dark Vessels exist within Friendly Dominion. Both coasts on the journey must be inside Friendly Dominion, but assuming that's true, um, Dark Vessels is essentially teleportation. It's it's a kind of sailing, and what it does is it lets you move uh, through oceans that you don't own, as if you were a sailing nation. So in this instance, I, I point this out because in this particular case, it's very, very important. So for example, right now, I have 39 units Pretty decent little expansion party, a few Facian archers who are unexceptional, and then a few Colossi Light, a bunch of Colossi Light infantry who are quite good. Um, but that's not a good enough army to take on these troops, 50 knights. If I didn't have the Dark Vessels, I would be stuck right now. I would be stuck going like, well, maybe I can go down here to fight these ghouls, but then I have to, I have to spend another turn. Oh, there's a river there. Okay, so I can't get across that. So I just have to wait another turn or two turns before I have enough troops to fight these knights. But no, I have the Dark Vessels. I can sail to any coast that's within my dominion. Um, Well, not any. I mean, I'm still constrained by movement points, by map move to an extent. But it means that this regular-ass commander guy can move two squares, two provinces, or three, this is actually three provinces, in pretty much any direction um, that has a coast, as long as he can trace a, a coastline to it. So for example there, that takes longer because that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That would be seven going by the coasts. But down here, he can hop one, two, three, bim, bam, boom, along the coasts and hit this province which is actually a pretty decent province, gives me some income, and expands my reach so that I kind of have all this stuff within my sphere of influence um, without having to deal with these knights yet. So I can kind of pick and choose. Facia gets that flexibility early on to pick and choose their targets. That's one of the reasons why Facia is a good nation. Many nations in this position would be, like, reasonably crippled. Like, I mean, it's turn 7. I do have a fort on the way, so I'm decent on forts. Um, income really good because I have these high income provinces, but just the fact that all the armies I was fighting were so hard means that uh, I'm I'm behind on expansion, like pretty significantly behind on expansion, to be honest. At turn seven, having six provinces is bad, um, but because of the dark vessels, I can skip past the hard province, hit one that's not very hard and uh, keep on rolling. And then I can maybe double back and take these two. Maybe I could go there, there, there. So maybe this army could take that province, that province, that province, and then join up with more troops from the capital to take that province and then go down here, this way on turn 12. That would be fine. That would get me a pretty substantial grip of land over here. While my Awake Expander can be down here cleaning up provinces, he's very tough, especially in my Dominion. This is a really good Awake Expander, the Dracon, with Regeneration and Reinvigoration Bless. And so if I do that, then by turn 12, I'll have like... 16, maybe 18 provinces, and that's perfectly respectable. So I'll have made up for my bad start because of the flexibility that Dark Vessels gives me. A corollary to this, Facia is one of the nations that actually wants to make a scout their profit because the Dark Vessels rely on having dominion on both ends, and profits spread dominion. So you want to, because uh, since he's the prophet, he spreads dominion by, he spreads a point of dominion everywhere he goes, like a disciple or like a pretender god, actually, in a way. And so uh, he gives you a he gives you a, a check where he is, and so that will put a candle where he is, 
and that enables you to create this situation where my Dominion would not naturally have spread this far, but because Enyalios has been walking in this direction, he's opened up tactical options for me. Um, this is helped by the fact that you don't really want to expand with your sacred units as face yet because they're not very good. But in any case, let's uh, time skip forward here. I'm going to hit turn 12 and we'll see where I am. All right, welcome back, folks. It is turn 12. We now have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 provinces, including a level 1 throne, the Throne of Stability. You may notice we still haven't taken these provinces because we didn't have to. We just kind of skipped them. We, uh, we weren't interested in, in fighting all these knights when we had uh, bigger fish to fry, easier targets to attack. Uh, and, of course, we are still drawing tax from these provinces because... Uh, Facia can trace tax and resource gain over water. So, we're doing well for ourselves. 16 provinces is okay for uh, year one. We've got, we've just actually now gotten the troops together to take on those knights, so we can do that, because I think this guy, oh, nope, he can't quite reach. So he's going to have to go up to Shadowglade. That'll waste a turn, but that's fine. You'll just patrol. Um, we were declared, uh, we had... Ashdod here declare war on us. The one true lizard pretty much just munched through them with no trouble. He did take one more affliction, so he now has a limp and a never healing wound, but he's eaten some mercenary heavy cavalry, he's eaten a couple of Anakites, he's eaten a whole bunch of Gileadites and Bashanites. Obviously the AI is not very good at recruitment, but nonetheless, he's cut through there. Meantime, my armies over here have taken these uh, six provinces, one, two, three, four, five, six, in the last five turns, despite... Uh, having actually been bumped by Oceania's army here in Kotakar a turn ago, and uh, having to also negotiate Flegra, who's over here, and uh, the AI has very much failed to expand, so we've kind of been bullying him a little bit. But I think you can see, this kind of gives an indication of what Facia can do in terms of expansion, even when hampered by a very poor start. A start where uh, the opposition is very, very tough. You're just going to have to take my word for that, because you didn't see the, the guys in these provinces. But for each of these four provinces, I had to send what I had by way of army and my Dracon to hit each province in sequence. Um, I didn't have another option, so I went over here, then I went up there, then the Dracon, all of the troops except the Dracon were dead. So the Dracon skipped down to Polgrave along with troops, then it hit Hogoria, and then he hopped over to Evergreen Forest and proceeded down that way. So, uh, 16 provinces, 12 turns, perfectly fine, could have been better could easily have been better. I got a little bit unlucky in terms of my my draw there. However, the income did help. The income helped me establish uh, as many forts as I want to. So I've got one palisade there, which will be upgraded next turn. I've got a fort here, which will be built next turn. And I have the income to start a fort right now here on the Misty Forest. So turn 12, one fort done, one done next turn, one in three turns. Uh, we've also found a couple of magic sites. We found an air site up here, the Thunder Oak. We also found an air site over there, the Enchanted Windmill. That's because I've been site searching almost exclusively for air sites. It's air sites that I'm interested in, interested in, if I can say words, um, because Phasia is primarily an air nation. Uh, air income is super, super important to Phasia. A lot of things are super important to Phasia. They have a lot of magic diversity, but particularly air. And that's because of they are mages. So let's take a look at Facia's units and mages. Basic scout, basic commander. Um, he has 60 leadership instead of 40, which is kind of neat. Um, he also has sailing. So Facian captains can lead any number of human size, max size two units across the ocean, even when they're not in dominion. The dark vessels allow Facian captains to lead any units, including uh, colossi, size three units that you have, uh, across the water as long as it's within your dominion so those two abilities make for an interesting kind of it's an interesting kind of balancing act as to what kinds of units you can take where with who uh, depending on whether you have dominion there or not in general you can go along any coast with anybody as long as it's in your dominion otherwise there are limitations basic level one priest also with sailing uh the mage pilot is your first mage uh reasonably efficient cheap researcher air one water one are not the best of paths but for low cost and nine resource points research points plus sailing eh, you know can't really expect much more the colossi weaver however is going to be your main mage literally the main mage for your entire nation 125 gold astral one air one with a random of all the elements plus astral dark vessels and a forge bonus of one so they reduce the cost these ladies reduce the cost of things they forge by one gem, which is an interesting and fairly rare ability. On top of that, they are giants. They have 19 hit points. 
And so, with uh, 19 hit points comes the ability to regenerate at plus 2 hit points per round. That's very interesting, especially on a communion mage, which is what these Colossi Weavers are. They are primarily air communion mages. Um, you can put these ladies into a communion, and then they boost each other's air paths, and as long as you're casting air spells, they'll get very little fatigue from that because they have the same paths as the communion masters. You can boost this further by using uh, power of the spheres and storm power once you cast storm. Uh, those kinds of boosting shenanigans that you can use to actually get your slaves to be higher path than your masters, in which case they're taking half fatigue. And since Colossi Weavers regenerate, uh, this allows you to do some of what we refer to as turbo communions, turbo communion shenanigans of the type that Jotunheim can do. Not quite as efficiently as Jotunheim can do it, but still very efficiently indeed. And basically that lets you stretch your communion mages further. I'll talk more about that in a bit, but keep in mind, Colossi Weavers are some of your most valuable mages, and in fact they're extremely good value mages, and would be for any nation. They're fantastic. This is another guy who's very, 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 very interesting. The Colossi Storm Captain. 175 gold, 38 resources, 2 recruitment points, good stat line, including high protection and high magic resistance. Sailing, dark vessels, but the most interesting thing about him, the most valuable thing about him, is that he's Air 2. Water 1, also kind of useful, but mainly Air 2. Air 2 means this guy can cloud trapeze, and it also means that he can cast Mist Form and Mirror Image. So, the Colossi Storm Captain ends up being one of the most efficient thugs in the game because he can't cloud trapeze, so he can use magic phase movement to suddenly appear in provinces that he normally wouldn't have access to, which means he can catch enemies unaware. His magic phase movement occurs before normal movement, so he can land on top of people before they have the chance to move away. Um, he can, of course, use magic weapons and armor, and he can cast some of the more powerful defensive buffs in the game, Mist Form and Mirror Image. On top of that, he can also cast Flight, which means that he can, once he buffs himself, cast Flight and hop directly to the rear of the enemy side of the battle line to attack mages or targets that are attempting to protect themselves behind infantry. Uh, that makes him extremely effective at raiding. A very good raider. If you give a Colossi Storm Captain a Frostbrand and a Vine Shield, um, he will he will just raid the hell out of the enemy all day, every day. Um, he'll hop in where you need him. He can cut off retreat from armies. He can hunt down sight-searching mages and kill them. He can do all sorts of things. He can cut off uh, lines of reinforcement between forts so that the enemy has to spend an extra turn moving their armies through the provinces that you have now taken and thus are enemy territory and have a movement penalty associated for them. Um, he, he's amazing. He's got all sorts of utility. Um, on top of that, because you have the Colossi Weavers, who have the Forge bonus and the variety of elemental paths, you can forge him a, a wide variety of extremely useful kit. You can forge him uh, Flasks of Holy Water to give him your Bless. You can forge him uh, Girdles of Strength to give him uh, Reinvigoration. You can forge him uh, Shields of Gleaming Gold, not with the, not with the Colossi Weavers because it requires Fire Earth Cross Paths, you have to use the Prince Consort for that, an Earth Random Prince Consort, but you can forge him all kinds of gear that's very, very useful for thugs. You can also forge him some national items because Facia has one national item. It's not necessarily suited for the Colossi Storm Captain, it's more for the Weaver, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But suffice it to say, the Colossi Storm Captain is a very good thug. He's sort of a, sort of a cut price Vanyarl. Um, but two-thirds of the cost. And he has not... I would say he has probably three-quarters of the utility of a Van Jarl for two-thirds of the price. He's a very good deal. You then have your, your slow-to-recruit mages. So you've got... One second, let me turn the music down just a little bit. That might be better. Music was getting a little bit loud for me, at least. The Wind Caller. Um, you honestly won't need too many of these. Wind Callers are the Facian equivalent of Baratian Storm Callers. Uh, Baratos is, of course, the early age nation that Facia is descended from. Um, they're not expensive. They are slow to recruit and old. Um, they give you access to Air 3, and they can be communioned if they random Astral. Um, they can be recruited in any uh, foreign coastal fort, in any, in any coastal fort, actually, as well as your capital. I would not spend capital turns on these guys, but on foreign forts, you may end up recruiting a few just for the higher levels of air. In the capital, you have two mages, the Prince Consort and the Colossi Queen. Both are very good, and this is actually honestly one of the things that makes Facia such a, a, an effective nation. All of their mages are at least sometimes useful. 
Prince Consorts start with Air 3 and can random Air 4, which automatically gives you access to the Air Boosters that can push you up to Air 6. So Prince Consorts break you into all the air pretty much you'll ever need. Um, they're holy, they have water and fire, and then they can random any of the elements including Earth, which can give you the Fire-Earth cross path, which is quite useful. They can also, of course, random Fire 2, and that gives you the cross paths to forge Rune Smashers, which are very, very useful for increasing your spell penetration. Colossi Queens are less useful, magically speaking, but they are holy too, and you can communion up priest levels to make them more powerful. Um, they can give you Water 3 or Air 3, but they don't give you Earth, and they can only have one fire, so overall Colossi Queens are less powerful and less useful than Prince Consorts, because their, their cross paths are less interesting. Um, however, they can always be communioned, and they can random Astral 2, which Prince Consorts can't. Prince Consorts can only... Prince Consorts actually can't be communioned, unless you forge them a, uh... I'm losing my mind. You know what I'm talking about. You forge them the thing, a Crystal Matrix, which, of course, uh, Earth Random Colossi Weavers can forge Crystal Matrixes, so you can bring Prince Consorts in that way. But yeah, all the mages quite powerful. The most important ones, Colossi Weavers for communioning, Colossi Storm Captains for thug use, and Prince Consorts for high-level air magic and for forging. In terms of troops, there's really only one unit down here that makes a whole lot of difference, which is the Colossi Light Infantry. The Colossi Light Infantry is the most efficient giant infantry unit in the game. Size 3, so you get 2 per square, 20 hit points, which is pretty good. Reasonably high strength, reasonably high defense skill, and low cost, especially in terms of resources. Cheap resource cost on a giant is very, very good. They have a javelin attack, which does high piercing damage. So this javelin can be very effective against most enemy infantry. Um, and of course, they each get to throw two javelins. And it has right length... Ugh, I'm losing my words again. It has range 14, which is high for thrown weapons. Uh, so Colossi Light Infantry, you can spam them, and they expand very efficiently, and they even beat most other people's national troops. As I said, this army here, this army had, it started off with about, like, a total of 40, 45, something like that. It landed here, and of course I reinforced occasionally to bring it up to that total of 45. It actually started with about 30. Took that province, that province, moved down here, took the province, was attacked by an expansion party of Oceania, beat that then came up here and took this province as well, along with um, 10 more. You know, like I said, the total of 45 includes two different reinforcement groups. So, yeah, and it's only at half strength after taking five provinces and beating an army. Uh, this over here, yeah, that's about all the ones I have left. I've been gathering these guys up, like I said, 30 of these, 10 more. Uh, about 50 of them will easily be able to take this province. I'm, I'm not worried about it. Even knights. I mean, knights will kill a Colossi Light Infantry, but they'll also be taking Javelin Fire, and then they'll get into melee and get stabbed, and Colossi Light Infantry are very, very good for their price. High damage spears, high damage ranged attacks, good defense and attack skills, relatively low cost, high hit points. They're very, very good infantry. All of Facia's other units, pretty crap. Overall, facing militia are garbage. They're militia. They're just they're just kind of garbage. Um, they're better than many militia units, but still bad. Um, Facian archers are standard like early age shortbow archers, which is not impressive in the middle age. Facian light infantry are literally independent light infantry, so not great. Uh, Facian infantry are just overall mediocre. They have a short sword, which isn't very good, and mediocre attack skill and prot and okay defense skill, but not great. Uh, Facey and Heavy Infantry are very resource-intensive for what they give you, um, because Plate Cuirass and Hoplite Helmet are both kind of expensive pieces of armor for their value. Like, the Plate Cuirass is one of the more resource-intensive pieces of armor in the game, and it's only Prot 14, which is very sad. So for Prot 15, yeah, I wouldn't pay 26 resources. Um, then you have the Colossi Light Infantry. Colossi Heavy Infantry are better than Facey and Heavy Infantry because... Their resource cost is less than double, but they have double the hit points and slightly more prot, so they're more useful. I still wouldn't necessarily buy them unless I was absolutely flush with resources and had nothing better to do. Um, the higher damage short sword is nice. And then you have your sacreds, the Orichalcum Guard. Orichalcum Guard are honestly pretty decent. It's just, once again, they're expensive. 40 gold and 53 resources. Um, Prot 18 is very good in the Middle Age. Defense skill 16 is very solid. If you want to, you can bless these guys heavily and use them heavily, but construction is going to be limited. 
Um, recruitment will be sharply limited by resources. You'll never be recruiting more than maybe four or five a turn. Um, and unlike the premier sacreds in the game, like Anakites, uh, they don't hurt enough to justify recruiting, leaning on them at four per turn. You're better served by just pumping out 10 or 12 or 15 Colossi Light Infantry instead, because you can get four Colossi Light Infantry for the resource cost of one or a Chalcom Guard. Yeah, literally. You can literally get four for one, and four Colossi Light Infantry will beat the hell out of one or a, or a Chalcom Guard. Uh, I'm sorry, it's just it's just true. Um, they do have magic weapons and bodyguard, so you may want some of them later on, but eh, I wouldn't pay much attention to them when you have a unit this good that you can spam. So that's Facian Expansion. It's basically just Colossi Light Infantry and an Awake Expander. You want an Awake Expander as insurance, and you want an Awake Expander because other people might want to kill you early on, because Facia uh, in the early game is okay, but not fantastic. And they're, they're okay. Like I said, Colossi Light Infantry are a good unit, um, they've got a lot of strategic mobility, so they're better than many nations, but the early game is the weakest Facia ever is. After the early game, they get so much stronger, so quickly. And the reason is, as I said, Colossi Weavers. Colossi Weavers are very, very good communion mages. They have air, they have astral, they have other randoms, they can be air too, so you can communion up Colossi Weavers to drop Thunderstrikes like you wouldn't believe. Facia might be the best air communion nation. Which is sort of weird to say in an age that includes uh, Calum and Pythium, which is a fantastic air communion nation, but but Facia beats them. Part of the reason they beat them is because of the fact that they're giants. So Colossi Weavers um, can forge bottles of holy water, or they can forge shrouds, which are and they get the get them at a discount. So four gems each. If you can manage to get some dwarven hammers, they can do them for two gems each. Fairly cheap. If you take a Regeneration Bless, which you'll notice is what I did, I took Regeneration as my Bless, uh, then they can, when they're wearing those, they'll regenerate, because they're Sacred and Blessed, and that will make them regenerate two hit points a turn. On top of that, you can weave a Nature Mage into the Communion somehow, just a, a random Nature 1 independent works fine with a, a Crystal Matrix, and just have him cast Personal Regeneration, so your Communion Slaves are now regenerating at 20%. Um, on top, they can hold uh, Coral Blades, which are a water item, which they can forge at a discount. Uh, and now they're, regenerate now they're regenerating off of their higher hit point total of 27. So now they're regenerating 6 hit points a turn. That's effectively regenerating at 30% compared to their standard hit points. If you do that, then what happens is you have like 2 or 4 Colossi Weaver Slaves, and they can support 6 casters indefinitely because as the casters push them up above 200 fatigue they'll start taking damage at one per 50 fatigue or fraction thereof that they get as they go over 200 fatigue um and as long as there's only six people casting spells and those spells key don't pass above 50 fatigue per spell um they'll just regenerate all the damage they take uh, this is the turbo communion this is when you have a you know you've got a communion set up now where your slaves can just support infinite spells, and they will never die unless something goes wrong. Uh, this is the thing that Jotunheim does with, um, and Niflheim do with their Scrati, with the, the werewolf slaves. It's easier for the Scrati because they have more HP and they already naturally regenerate, but um, so they're more effective at it, but they're also a lot more expensive and slower to recruit. Colossi Weavers, you can afford to have a communion with like eight Colossi Weaver slaves, uh, if you really want to invest, if it's a really important battle, you can have, or let's say four, you can have four with coral blades and shrouds. Then if you get nature magic from somewhere, you can also slap rings of regeneration on them, in which case now they're regenerating like eight or ten hit points around. Uh, and it gets to the point where you can just have a communion that is just constantly casting Thunderstrike, 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 Thunderstrike for the whole battle, uh, and the slaves never die. Unless you're losing the battle, of course, but hopefully if you have that many Thunderstrikes, you're winning the battle. So that tactic is something that most nations just simply cannot match, just can't do. And the nations that can do it are very powerful because of it. Like I said, Niflheim and Jotunheim are powerful largely off the basis of this Turbo Communion strategy. It's not as specifically powerful for Facia, they require more mages to pull it off. Uh, but not all that many more, and... It's not like 
that's a problem because their mages are so much cheaper. Like, a Scrati is literally twice the cost of a Colossi Weaver and also costs two turns to recruit. With Colossi Weavers, like, looking at these mages that I have right now, I could set up a Turbo Communion right now if I had the research. I've got Aulus, who has Air 2. I've got uh, Hibarkidna, who has Air 2. I've got Miliboya, who has Air 2. So I could set those three up. Um, I'd need to forge, like I said, bottles of holy water or shrouds or a couple of communion slaves. I'd probably use like these two since they have just uh, one point randoms. They don't have anything special about them. So I'd set up those two. We'd form the communion. They'd buff all of my casters, my three casters up to air three. Uh, one of my casters could then cast storm. One of them could cast power of the spheres and one of them could cast storm power. After we've done all that, we'll have some pretty significant uh, fatigue on my Colossi Weavers, but uh, they'll all be bu buffed up uh, two levels, so they'll all be Air 3 and Astral 3, and that will put them put them above the base level of the Communion Masters, so now they're taking half fatigue from spells. They're also regenerating, because my Bless has regeneration. So they're regenerating two hit points around. round. Uh, if I have Coral Blades on them, they'll be regenerating three hit points per round, and they'll be able to support those three casters indefinitely. If not, they will slowly take damage over time, eventually, but they still probably won't die before the battle is over, unless the battle lasts a very long time, which in the early game it won't. So, uh, that on top of the mobility of the Colossi Storm Captains, who can just para-drop in behind the enemy and cut off their retreat as you force them into a battle with your Turbo Communion, which, oh, by the way, also has Dark Vessels. So your Turbo Communion, and map move 20, because they're Giants, and Giants have high map move. So this Turbo Communion, I can take these ladies, like these ones, and just, you know, go there. I can't go there, because once again I'd have to go around. But I can go to Evergreen Forest. Just, whoop! Most of the time you can't move a Communion to provinces, including a forest. That's not usual, because Communion Mages tend to be small old men with low map move. Facia does not have that weakness. Facia is fast, Facia is powerful, uh, all of Facia's mages are ready to go, and they'll, uh, yeah, they'll wreck your shit. Uh, one other way to do this is to add a couple extra HP to your Bless, and not have, either not have regeneration or take, like, Nature 9, which I think is prohibitively expensive. Um, if you do that, you have to take an Immobile, which I think hampers you. It, it's more of a gamble to take an Immobile. But if you do that, if you have Regeneration and plus 2 HP on your Bless, then your Colossi Weavers are already regenerating 3 hit points because they're HP 21 and regen rounds up. And then you put on the Coral Blade, and then you put on the Ring of Regeneration, or cast Personal Regeneration, and you stack up to like 12 or 15 Regeneration per Weaver, and it gets pretty silly. So that's Facia's kind of mid-game plan, is those powerful Air Communions where they cast Thunderstrike, they summon Elementals, uh, later on they drop Fog Warriors, they can cast uh, they can cast the Astral Spells, of course. Um, you know, Light of the Northern Star to, bur to boost Astral Magic, and then they can cast Will of the Fates to give everybody luck. They can cast, they can Etherealize their units if they want to, although I wouldn't necessarily bother because they're pretty cheap. Colossi Light Infantry or Chaff, they're just giant Chaff. Uh, but they can they can just do a lot of things. Air magic and astral magic are two of the most powerful battlefield paths, and having access to these powerful elite communions uh, makes Facia an enormously powerful battlefield uh, faction, as it were. They also have quite a bit they can do in the ritual sphere, although a lot of it is somewhat hard for them to access, and this is a little bit of a limiting factor. Their best mage for rituals is the Prince Consort, but the Prince Consort, the only thing he actually has high is air. Everything else he's kind of limited to two, and it's hard to get some of the boosters that you might want won't really be easy to get. Um, so let's hop over into the Mod Inspector, take a look at that. Okay, so here we are in the Mod Inspector. This is the list of all of uh, all of Facia's national spells. They have Pride of Lions, which they can't easily cast. It's not a very good spell anyway. They then have a bunch of the Greek-specific spells, um, some of which are good and some of which are not. Um, the first is Contact Hesperide. Hesperides are actually quite good. They're very powerful mages, cost 35 fire gems, and they require fire 3. Now, this isn't something that Facia natively gets. The highest face you natively gets is reliably Fire 2 on their Prince Consorts. You can random a Fire 3, but it's very unlikely to actually happen 
because it requires you to hit a 10% random and then get the correct one out of four paths. That's 2.5%, but then also you have a 25% chance to get fire on your random in the first place. So actually, it's about 6 out of 100. Um, or 1 out of... Yeah, not... I'm sorry, 6 out of... Uh, 1,000. It's about 6 out of 1,000 Prince Consorts will have fire 3. Um, and of course, they won't have Astral, so you'll still have to empower in Astral. Or you can get a, a fire random on your Colossi Queens, but then you have to manage to boost their fire high enough to cast the spell. In any case, if you can cast the spell, then Hesperides are great. They're, they're really powerful mages, powerful fire, powerful astral, good nature, they're sacred, they have a huge amount of awe, they heal diseases, they give you a supply bonus and decrease unrest. They're really, really amazing mages. They're just very difficult for middle age phasia to get unless you build a pretender god to get them which i wouldn't say is worth it uh you have the hounds of twilight once again phasia can't cast this um they don't have death and they actually don't have earth two either the highest they get once again reliably is earth one um and hounds of twilight of course required earth death cross paths that you just don't get dogs of gold and silver Facia can cast very easily, and in fact, they're the only nation that can cast it. This spell is Facia exclusive. Unfortunately, it's not a great spell. Um, when you cast this, it costs seven earth gems, and it summons these two dogs, one of each. Um, and they're not very good. They're very tough. They have prot 25, 17 or 21 hit points, so fairly high hit points. Um, and they have uh, effectively temper flesh, slash, blunt, and pierce resistance, Plus, they resist all elements very effectively, and they have bodyguard values. The downside to them is, well, like I said, they're just not very good at fighting. The only weapon they have is a bite, which doesn't do all that much damage. Uh, they only have one attack each. They're not... I, I have a hard time seeing this spell being worth seven earth gems. If for some reason I had a lot of earth gems as Facia, and I needed bodyguards, or if I needed powerful patrollers... Yeah, okay. I mean, when you summon these guys, they have a total patrol bonus of plus 20. And there's two of them, of course, and they have high combat speed and high precision and high map move. So they're good patrollers. I don't know what exactly the patrol formula is, but it's not one point per unit. It's related to movement speed and it's related to precision, I believe. Um, so yeah, they patrol really, really well if you need to patrol something out. It's just that you won't often need that this badly, and most of the time you'll just have troops around that you can use. Um, if you're faced with a lot of assassins, I could see potentially using the Quons, the Quon Crisios, I can't pronounce that word, and the Quion uh, Argyros? Argyros, I think. In any case, you could use the dogs if you really, really need bodyguards, but, eh? I mean, against, like, a swarm assassin, they're still not going to work, because they rely on prot, and swarm bugs will bite through that with their armor negating attacks. Against Skella spam assassins, they're not going to work. I... They're just, they're an answer to a problem you don't really have, and they don't answer the problems you do have. So I don't really think this spell is worth it. I could see it being used sometimes, but not often. Uh, you can craft the Keladones. Craft Keladones is another spell that I'm skeptical of the value of, but some people think it's it's useful in the right context. Um, it summons a communion slave. That's all it does. It's a spell singing communion slave. Um, immobile, once again, high protection, resistant to all kinds of elements and all kinds of damage, high hit points. So, uh, the biggest problem with them is, in my opinion, that they can't move. Oh, and that they require pretty high paths to craft. I mean, Earth 2, Astral 2, it's like, eh, eh. Do I really want to waste the time of that mage casting this spell? It summons one communion slave. Um, your Facia, you have high quality communion slaves coming out your ears. Your basic mages are high quality communion slaves. You don't really need Keladones. Um, especially because, as I said, they can't move. They're like province defense. It's like spending gems to summon province defense communion slaves. I don't know. That said, they're very tough. They're hard to kill. They're immune to most of the things that wipe out communions, like Earthquake, they don't care. Firestorm, they don't care. Acid Storm, they don't care. Uh... Uh, what other... There's no battlefield wipe that bothers these ladies. Um, except for... Yeah, they're even lifeless, so they're not even bothered by rigor mortis. Or anything. 
Uh, there's no way to take them off the field except by deliberately targeting them and killing them with something that hits very, very hard. So if you want a very tough communion, if you need to have, like, surety in your communion guarding a throne or something, yeah, sure, summon some Keladones. If you have the gems for it and a mage who can cast it, absolutely. They will give you toughness. That's all they'll give you, but they'll give it to you. Uh, you can forge the Brass Bull, Kalkatoris. Once again, it requires Fire 3 and Earth 3, which you don't natively have. In order to cast this, you would need either an independent mage like a Sorcerer of the Sands or something, or a, a Golden Order Sorcerer, a Golden Order Adept, or you would need a god designed for it. Um, the Kalkatoris, a little bit expensive, I think, 30 fire, but often fire gems are fairly low value, and it gives you a very powerful trampler. It has multiple attacks, size 5, lots of hit points, lots of prot, resists all the elements, resists all kinds of damage, and uh, tramples. So, if you want that, it works. I think it's too expensive for a summon that's not a mage, but once again, this is something I've had discussions on Discord about. Personally, my personal opinion, I don't think Facia really needs or uses any of these three spells. It can't use this one. It would love to use this one, but it's going to be difficult to get. You're probably going to have to empower somebody in fire. Like, you're probably going to have to get a fire one random Colossi Queen, buy a fire booster off someone, so a Skull of Fire or a Flaming Helmet, and then also still empower her a level in fire. So it'll be expensive, but if you can get up there to contact Hesperides, Hesperides are absolutely worth it. So you can try to use this one. I wouldn't even bother thinking about these four spells, unless you're in a real specific situation where you desperately need them. This spell, once again, something that's very hard for you to cast, uh, but really cool if you can. This spell, like um, the Keladones and the Brass Bulls, I, and, and the Hesperides actually, most of these spells, I think were more designed for Erythia, the Late Age Nation, than you, and they just kind of gave them to Facia as well, just because. But, I mean, Ladon's cool. Ladon's huge, has tons of native regeneration, um, is unsurroundable, multiple poisonous attacks, very poisonous attacks, high prot, high hit points, um, you do have to cast a Gift of Reason on him or something because he starts off as a troop. He's not actually a commander. Um, if we go to Advanced, we can see here he doesn't get his item slots until you actually give him reason somehow. But of course, if you can summon late on, then you're very, very likely to be able to cast Gift of Reason because it means you have nature magic. Specifically, it means you have fire nature cross paths, um, which Facia absolutely does not get. So, if you can get him, he's cool. But once again, this is kind of one of the limitations of Facia. Basically, none of their national spells actually matter to them much. This is the only one that they can cast out of the box, um, and it's not very good. In terms of what spells Facia wants to be casting, on the other hand, there's actually a lot. Let's start by looking at air rituals, uh, not national ones. We can only look at generic ones. Um... Perpetual Storm is something that Facia can cast uh, natively and is kind of cool because it gives you a storm everywhere. Um, it does make sailing impossible, but I don't think... Now, I haven't tested this, actually, but I don't think that affects the Dark Vessels. I think the Dark Vessels still work. Obviously, you want to be summoning Queens of Elemental Air. Once again, Facia can do that natively. As soon as you get an Air 4 random uh, Colossi uh, Noble, you're in the money. Um... You can cast Gale Gate natively, so that's the Air Gem Gen. 20 Air Gems per turn, Thaumaturgy 8. You're going to be going down Thaumaturgy anyway, because you are, uh, excuse me, you are an Astral Nation, so you want Gale Gate, and you're very likely to be able to cast it. Uh, once you cast it, of course, your air income will skyrocket, and then, and it also hurts everybody by dropping hurricanes on provinces you don't own. So, it's perfect. It's fantastic for you. Uh, Seeking Arrow, you can spam the hell out of Seeking Arrow. All of your, your nobles can cast this out of the box because they all start Air 3, and a lot of your queens can cast it too, so a lot of your cap-only mages can throw Seeking Arrows. Um, even some of your non-cap-only mages, Wind Callers, that random Air 3 can throw Seeking Arrows. Uh, very, very useful. Obviously, Cloud Trapeze, you'll be casting a lot. You'll be, all of your Air Mages can just be raining from the skies in all directions. They're all Giants. Uh, your thugs, your Colossi Storm Captains can thug very effectively, but also your Colossi, I keep calling them nobles and that's not what they're called. One second, I have to pull up Facia here so that I can actually remember my words. Prince Consort, that's it. Your Prince Consorts can Cloud Trapeze, and they can also thug, especially if they random Earth. 
then they're pretty they're pretty badass thugs if they do that. Colossi Queens can cloud trapeze. Uh, some of them can also teleport if you equip them with an astral booster, which you can definitely do because you can forge the astral boosters. So they can teleport in to support your armies. Your prince consorts can cloud trapeze in. Facia has incredible mage mobility, and that's a very, very useful part of the nation, something that you should be leaning on very heavily. Um, the other earth spells, eh, you'll be casting auspex, obviously. That's a cheap and easy way to speed up your uh, air gem acquisition. In terms of Astral, you're not super high-powered on Astral, but you're high-powered enough. You can get up to Astral 4 without too much trouble. Um, you can cast Teleport, obviously. You can cast a Gateway. Gateway can be very useful because um, your Colossi Queens have high leadership. So once again, if you get an Astral 2, Astral Random, uh, and then you put uh, two boosters on her, she's Astral 4, and now you can take 80 units and teleport them between any two of your forts with Gateway. It's a very useful ability, expensive, so use it sparingly, but if you need an army right there, right now, you can have it. Uh, it's harder to cast Stellar Focus because getting up to Astral 5 is a little bit tricky for you unless you can get a hold of one of the, like, one of the high-level boosters. You may have to empower somebody to get up to Astral 5. Uh, but, honestly, Astral 4 is enough to do a lot of stuff, especially because then you can get into combat. Uh, Astral 4 is enough to mind hunt a little bit if you want to mind hunt. I wouldn't really do it with much with Facia. But you can do Arcane Probing to find more Astral spells, more Astral Sights. Uh, astral Protection I don't use all that much, but it can be nice if you know you're fighting somebody who doesn't have Astral Magic. You can dispel other people's globals. That's very useful. Um, you can drop the Dome, Dome of Arcane Warding, which can be handy late game in order to stop people from casting spells onto you. Uh, and in Combat, of course, if we look at Astral Combat spells... Um, you can Magic Duel. Your Communion Mages are a little bit more expensive than most plate people, so I would deploy this sparingly, but it can be done, certainly. And, of course, you can easily ramp up in combat to cast any Astral Combat spell. Except, possibly, it's hard for you to cast Master and Slave. You're not one of the very, very strongest Astral Nations, but you can do it. You can still cast Master and Slave. I mean, if you have eight Slaves, that's a three-path boost. Light of the Northern Star is a boost. Power of the Spheres is a boost. So that's five paths which means you only actually have to be Astral 3 to potentially ramp up to casting Master and Slave. That's something to think about. Uh, and obviously you can cast Returning, so you can Cloud Trapeze uh, a Colossi Queen in to cast some devastating spell that you've empowered her to cast and then return out. Or you can Forge a Ring of Returning to do the same thing the first time she takes a hit. Lots and lots of great options with Astral Magic. It's, I mean, it's one of the most powerful schools in the game. And, of course, Air is another of the most powerful schools in the game. Uh, with Air, you can be casting Storm, which shuts down uh, missiles and also empowers your air magic. You can be casting Wrathful Skies or Shimmering Fields later in the game for massive damage. You can cast Wind Guide to make your javelins more accurate if you want to, although you don't really need to. You can even cast Flaming Arrows with your uh, Prince Consorts in order to make them to set all those javelins on fire. Fog Warriors will be a staple of your combat strategy, as, of course, will Living Clouds and Summon Air Elemental. Um, spamming out Living Clouds and then dropping Fog Warriors on them is almost disgusting. Uh, mass Flight can also be hilarious when you have a, a whole bunch of those giant Colossi Light Infantry you've been using all game, and you drop some buffs on them and you cast Mass Flight, and all of a sudden they're all up in your enemy's grill just stabbing them to death with giant spears. It's pretty nice. Um, and eventually, you can cast uh, you can cast Mist of Deception to spam out a whole bunch of Phantasms. I haven't cast this spell in a long time. I don't know if it was changed at the same time Howl was. So it may not be as effective as it used to be. But it's basically Mist plus randomly spawning Phantasmal soldiers that get in the enemy's way. Which is sort of hilarious. In any case, like I said, Air and Astral are your main schools, your main paths. Everything else is sort of secondary. You do have a pretty decent amount of water. So you can also do water magic. Um... Going underwater is somewhat difficult for you, because you don't have any amphibious units or mages, but you can use water magic pretty effectively, especially uh, personal quickness. Not quickness, personal quickness. Ew, where is Quick and self, there it is. Um, that's one of the spells that makes your storm captains very, very good. You can double their speed and have them clear two squares per turn with frost brands. Um, also, Liquid Body, which is sort of an off-brand Temper Flesh. It does slow you down, but it gives you all the damage resistance, and it gives you Affliction Resistance, which extends their lifespan quite a bit. 
Um, you can also, if you're underwater, you can cast Ice Shield, but... Meh. You're not going to be underwater, realistically speaking. So, that's face yet. Let's actually hop back into the game for a second so I can kind of look around at stuff while I'm talking. Alright, so as I was saying, that's Facia. They're a very, very powerful nation starting from the mid-game and then ramping all the way up into the end game. Late game Facia that has gotten the Queens of Elemental Air out, has cast Gale Gate, is rolling into battle with fast moving turbo communions, backing up large, large groups of giant infantry with buffs stacked on top of them, is dropping Will of the Fates and Fog Warriors to keep their troops alive, spamming Thunderstrikes and Air Elementals, very, very scary. But, that's not all they are. If that was all they are, they would be tough, but a very one-note nation, easy to counter. You drop in one thug wearing copper armor, holding barrier, or, um, Scutata Volturnus, and wearing a ring of tamed lightning. Now he has, like, fucking 50 shock resistance, and the air elementals and the thunderstrikes and all don't bother him at all. If that was all Facia was, they wouldn't be too scary. But on top of that, they're an astral nation. And since they're astral, and they get randoms on their colossi weavers and they can set up Turbo Communions, they can cast any, like, level 4 or 5 Earth spell, any Fire spell, any Water spell. Um, they can cast a lot of times. You can get, you know, one of these guys in there, tie him into the Communion. Now they can cast, like, Acid Storm. They can go way off the chain, casting any Elemental spell if they set it up properly. So in the mid-game, Facia is sort of this more one-note Air Nation, Air Communion Nation. But in the late game, as they get set up to do more and more and more and more, their combat possibilities really spiral out of control. Um, and you end up, a war against Facia is like fighting elves and fighting giants, because you've got these, these air dropping in thugs taking your provinces behind you, you've got these communions rolling ahead, you know, spamming out thunder strikes and air elementals, and then you, you build up a counter to that, and then this asshole drops in and casts Acid Storm, and your whole whole army melts, while the giants regenerate through it, because they have high hit points and regeneration, and they've cast Iron Skin on themselves, and luck, and yada yada yada. Um, it's a problem. It can be a real bummer. So that's Facia. They're, they're one of the more powerful nations in the game, because they have all this flexibility. Now, what they don't have, and what keeps them from being, like, a brokenly powerful nation, is they don't have one cool trick. They don't have the one super powerful thing that the really powerful nations have. They don't have Anakites. They don't have, uh, the communicants, the feared communicants that Pythium can recruit that are fucking units that are also communion slaves. They don't have the turn zero communions that Flegra has, where Flegra can just walk in and cast Earthquake six times on round zero. They don't have one cool trick. They have a whole bunch of tricks. They have a lot of stuff they can pull out of their sleeves once they've got the research for it, but they don't have that one defining thing. They don't have super combatants. They don't have... Uh, you see what I'm saying. They don't have the gimmick. They have a lot of different gimmicks, all of which are good, but none of which are defining. So, playing as Facia, the question is can you adapt your wide, powerful toolkit to counter the gimmicks that the enemy is coming at you with. Because, like, if you start next to Ashdod like this and it's a human player, you're dead. He's he's, he's gonna rush you with Anakites, and you better think real, real quick to get these mages to do something that will stop these Anakites from rushing up here and jamming their size 36 combat boot way up your butt. Um, if you're starting next to Pythium, you're gonna end up in a communion off, and in the early game, you'll actually lose that, because Pythium can spam out Communion Slaves by recruiting Communicants, which you can't necessarily match in numbers until you've got your Turbo Communion stuff online, and that doesn't come online until after Construction 4 or 6. And of course, you also have to have your combat research. Pythium just has to do the combat research, and then they can, they can roll in, because they don't care if their Communicants die. Um, if you start next to who else? Who else is a good, strong, middle-aged gimmick nation? Oh, if you start next to Nazca, you're going to be drowned in birds and you can't do anything about it. But then that's every nation that starts next, next to Nazca, so you're not special. In any case, Phasia is, you know, I'd put them, I don't know, in the middle age, like, number five, number six, number four, something up in that. They're up there. They're not the very top broken nations, like... Nazca, arguably Ashdod, maybe Ulm. They're, they're kind of on Ulm level. They're strong. They've got a very, very solid foundation to work from, 
but the game is still yours to win or lose. So, hopefully this has been helpful. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below, and I'll try to answer them. I can't promise, of course, that everything I say will be accurate, useful, or true, but uh, we'll do our best. So, thanks so much for watching. If you liked this, leave a like on the video, let YouTube know. Uh, consider supporting the channel through the Patreon or by subscribing. And whether you do or not, of course, I will see you all in the next one. Take care. Okay, all that talking about Facia, and I managed to almost just outright miss one of the most important things of talking about a nation, which is pretender design. Unfortunately, Facia is one of those nations where the, the correct quote-unquote pretender is kind of staring you in the face. It's the Drakon. Um, the Drakon is an amazing awake expander. Uh, it's super cheap for what it does. It has nature magic, which gets you that regeneration bless that you want for your turbo communions. And it has earth, which makes it high prot so it can expand more reliably. And also gets you the really, really useful sort of utility earth blesses. You can take fire and shock resistance, or you can take double reinvigoration. Uh, there's like, <sighs> there are other options, obviously, but like, you can basically ignore this whole section. Just, the Titans are just bad. There's no reason to take them for Facia, especially not when you want such very specific things out of your god. Um, you could take the Statue of Fertility. You'd get your Bless a lot cheaper, so you could have better scales. And Facia does love scales, so you can take an Awake Statue of Fertility, eat three. If you want, you can take Misfortune three. I like to take Luck, obviously, but if you're taking an Awake Expander, Misfortune three is pretty much mandatory. And you could easily take it with her and then you have a whole bunch of scales so now you could have like magic three or something like that and a uh, couple extra points of dominion all uh, right cut that down to four now you can have another scale yet so now you can have a point of prod as well or something like that that could definitely work um if you wanted to go cheaper you could take the great white bull instead of the dracon that would save you a few points i'm not i don't think it would save you a scale entirely um yeah, you're two points short of it saving you a scale, unfortunately, so you end up with this awkwardly high amount of points left. So I'd probably just go Earth 5. If you want Fire Shock Resistance, the Great White Bull will give it to you for the same scale price as a Dracon with um, Reinvigoration times 2. Fire Shock Resistance is a good bless because it makes your Turbo Communions uh, unlikely to blast themselves to death with Lightning, and it means you can cast Wrathful Skies more reliably. Other options, if you want to be, if you want to get away from the boring old dragon, you would take the gray ones. The gray ones are the only trinity that's actually worth it because they're super cheap and they don't have a research penalty. So if you take awake gray ones with some extra paths, um, you can have decent scales, and you can also get a mad, just a crazy amount of research right off the bat. They all get half of your death and water paths, so you could take like water four, death four. Now at this point, I would probably also take fire four. Um, and what this will do is this will let you forge staffs of elemental mastery with one of them, the one who gets the fire, uh, the warlike gets your fire and earth paths, whatever you take. So the way, when you take the gray ones, they split all your paths up. They all get half of the water and death you paid for, and then each of them gets two other paths. So one of them gets whatever fire you got and whatever earth you got. One of them gets whatever blood and whatever nature. So blood and nature, and then one of them gets whatever air and whatever astral. And if you got... Yeah, I guess that's all the paths. So yeah, each of them will only have a maximum of four paths, but you can take, like... Actually, you could just go three across the board here. You could get a, a, a rainbow bless, and then a couple points of something else, um, and they'd all have a ton of research points. And so you can get, like, 30 or 40 research right off the bat. And then if you're willing to tank your scales a little bit, you know, you can go Misfortune 3. That gives you even more points. Now you can, like... Now you could go actually full rainbow, which would be a little bit hilarious. And, uh, yeah, that could be kind of funny. I don't know what you do with a rainbow bless for Facia. You don't need it or really want it. But, uh, the possibility exists. Uh, the main point of the gray ones is just to take a whole bunch of paths so that you can have a whole bunch of research so that you can hit your early research goals like turn five or tur before your first war. Um, you could potentially take the Golden Lion for a cheaper expander. That gives you fire and nature, so if you do that, then you have a god that can summon Hesperides. That's pretty useful. However, it's kind of expensive for what it gives you, and it doesn't give you that Earth Bless, so, like, none of the fire stuff is great for your communions. You could take Inspirational Presence, I guess, but your main commanders are not sacred, so it doesn't really help you that much. Uh, if I was going to go this route, I would actually probably just go Whole Hog and take Awe. Um... 
and like you'd want to drop something in order to get you'd probably drop a point of turmoil and take to take a reasonable dominion score uh turmoil and misfortune is kind of an awkward combination but it's usually not too bad if you know how to mitigate it then you can take on regeneration which is a good thug bless like that will help your uh your storm captains out tremendously but Eh, it doesn't really help your communions, except for the regeneration. The awe doesn't really do anything for the communions, is what I'm saying. So I would classify that as a suboptimal but still playable pick. Facey has a strong and flexible enough nation that most things are playable. It's just, it's just that this is, in my opinion, clearly optimal. You take the Dracon, and now I have a couple of scales, and like, this is fine. I'm negative two scales, technically, but... I'm still actually positive on income, everything except luck. And if I'm worried about luck, then what I can do is I can drop a little bit of turmoil, cut that down to misfortune one. Now my luck won't even really be bad. Uh, I'm not recruitment point capped, I'm mainly resource capped. So I could even probably do that and still be okay. You can play around with your scales quite a bit because Facier is very forgiving. Your main unit is quite cheap. Your mages are not expensive for what they give you. Um, your thugs are not expensive. Like your Colossi Light Infantry, like I said, really you're going to end up resource or gold capped before your recruitment point capped most of the time. Uh, and so this just kind of gives you everything you want. You've got Reinvigoration and Regeneration. That's a good thug bless. It's a good bless for your communions. Um, it's a great expander, so it gives you a strong early game, which is the part of the game when you're weakest. It, I, I really have a hard time seeing anything but the Dracon as optimal in order for the dracon not to, to be not optimal it would have to cost like two extra scales like it would have to be straight up 300 points for me to not take the dracon on flegra on facia i'm sorry um and honestly even if it was 300 points i might still just do this you know so in any case your mileage may vary but that's kind of how i feel about it um you could potentially take the hound of hades the hound of hades is a legitimate expander a um, little bit cheaper, doesn't have the regeneration though, once again. So if you take the Hound of Hades, then what you're going to do is you're probably going to want a whole bunch of Undying, which just makes your, your communion guys more resilient. And then you're also going to want, of course, Earth, so you'll take Fire and Shock Resistance probably. So it'll be like Undying, Fire Shock Resist times 5, uh, not Fortitude. Um, That's a pretty decent bless, it gives you better scales. Now I can take, uh, I can have two more scales after this, so I could have, you know, I could be neutral scales, or I could take the misfortune in exchange for magic and really ramp my research up as quick as I can. That's possible, that's viable, but to be honest, Facia already has really good research because they've got decent research out of the Colossi Weavers, plus they have a ton of air, so as soon as they hit Construction 2, they can start churning out quills, and then their research skyrockets pretty quickly. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily worry about it too much. I'd probably take, like, something like that. Maybe one of each. Maybe just an extra point of Dominion, because spreading your Dominion is really, really cool as Facia, because, of course, spreading your Dominion gives you, uh, gives you more places you can sail to. So something like... Mm, for the sake of efficiency, and because it annoys me to have that, I'd probably... Ugh, that's irritating. Oh god, that's irritating. Whew. Yeah, that gives you an awkward number of points left. I probably would. I think probably having the 6 Dominion is most efficient, and then you just have friggin' 25 points left over. As annoying as that is. Um... Yeah, that doesn't help you. Yeah, probably you just have 25 points left over. That's That irritates me deeply. At a, at a, my OCD is just absolutely triggered right now. But that probably gets you the best scales, balance with paths and all that. So you could use the Hound of Hades. That would let you summon, um, cast the, the Death Earth cross path summoned to summon the, the smaller dogs. But I don't know if that's worth a god. I don't think it is, really. Um, I... If you're if you're tryharding, just stick with the Dracon, really. Most of the time, stick with the Dracon. Um, if you want to gamble, the Grey One is a decent gamble because the Grey One gives you that, that really, really high level of research. So that will let you hit your early research goals faster. 
but of course you're sacrificing a lot of early game expansion power and defense power for that. Like if you start next to Ashdod or any Rush Nation and you have an awake gray one as your god, you're screwed. There's there's no help for you. You're doomed. Uh, make peace with your gods because you won't be seeing them long. In any case, um, I think that's all I had to say about it. So thanks once again for listening and I'll see you next time.